Hello, I'm Robert Pearson, this is Follow the Leader, and we're doing a thing. Um, this is the last day before the, uh, the book that I've been reviewing and reading and stuff has, uh, is going to come out. My goal was to go through the little, like, X cards that it came with, the multiplication cards, uh, every day. I'll probably be doing that every day after this. They're, it's difficult, because they're all kind of in the same direction. So I wanted to just like use it as a, a talking point and then I realized very quickly all the talking points are basically the same. So I'll probably just uh, throw it out there and then uh, do something else for, for that stream or whatever. Um, I'm still playing around, still figuring this whole internet thing out and I have, don't have my groove yet. Anyway, um, so his book comes out tomorrow. I read it, it was part of the launch team, got the launch team package or whatever. So tomorrow there's a, another Zoom call with the author, which is kind of cool. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, it was, it's a good book. I recommend you pick it up if it's your, if it's your jam. Um, and I kind of want to talk about what the book is about, more or less. Um... It's, it's kind of a, a side note slash the whole book. Let, let's just jump into it. Work is important. I would argue that work is the meaning of life. Now that's, that's a bold statement and like a lot of the Bible college types are just like, but the curse, but Eden. Ah. That's, you're wrong though. Uh, see, the word to in English and in, in Hebrew, that's an, it's a conjunction, and it connects two words and phrases, right? We all learned that with an awesome song. Uh, to implies purpose, for the reason of, for this reason. And, uh, you know, I don't find anywhere that the meaning of life is to worship God. Uh, I think that is a byproduct of living properly and, and you know, doing your, uh, your work in a way that pleases God. Worship is a byproduct of, of living well. Um, Genesis 2.15, God makes man, and it says, And he placed man in the midst of the garden to purpose or direction. And then... There are two words there that are usually, usually rendered in a very soft way to cultivate and keep it. The, the Hebrew words are work and protect. Now, yes, the word protect can be used also in the way that you would keep a commandment. But uh, man was put in the garden for two reasons, to work and protect. To work in the garden and protect it. Very specifically, that would have meant tilling the ground. And uh, in a general sense, though, work. We're put on earth for the purpose of working. Not that life would be easy, but that we would work. Uh, that's what God did when he worked uh, all the work of his hands, the heavens. The first place, uh, there's a different word for work that is specifically anchored to labor. So the word for work, uh, I think is in, uh, in Genesis 2.15 is the one that also could be make or do. It's a little bit of a catch-all word. It's a much broader meaning. There's a more new, uh, more specific word in Hebrew that's just work. Like anytime you do anything like for a job. It narrows down quite a bit um, to a, a physical manual labor or task. Whereas you could uh, the, the one for man to work and keep the garden is, is uh, can be a little more general and uh, used metaphorically sometimes or even for uh, the word thing, a work, uh, something that someone has done, the work of someone's hands, an object. Uh, I, I believe, not, this is off the top of my head, I haven't looked at it for months. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm in the ballpark of the idea. The point is, God works, and reflecting His image, we work. And when we're reflecting God's image properly, that becomes worship. Uh, worship isn't limited just singing to God on Sunday, right? Uh, the uh, 
You don't have to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Uh, giving your, your due worship. Uh, you'd be a living sacrifice. Uh, Romans 12, 1-ish. Robert's paraphrase from Awanas from, you know, 20 years ago. But the, uh, that'd be more than 20 years. It'd be, anyway, yeah, like 25 years ago, probably, when I was in Awanas. The point is, the point is that the only time it expresses God placing man for a specific purpose, that purpose is to work and protect. And, uh, and that, get, that gets brushed over very quickly. And it's important to notice that this is an immortal being. Sin hasn't entered the garden. We're in chapter 2 right now. Woman's not even made yet. It's just Adam and God hang it out. God makes Adam outside of the garden. Uh, which has a neat... No! Phone call, no. No. I don't know what good do not disturb does. I'm thoroughly flustered by that. I don't know of a single man whose heart doesn't sing at the words work and protect. Uh, you can watch any action movie, and it's a hard-working man protecting the innocent. Every time. Every action movie. And I think, I think Hollywood and uh, sort of the, the popular consciousness is a good place to look at what the natural lean is of man. Uh, because it'll show you. It's towards towards sinfulness, away from godliness, and, mind you, and, the things that are good, generally everyone will agree are good, are things that you can just observe. Uh, it's obviously they're true because God says they're true. Uh, but, like, nobody argues that protecting the innocent is a good thing. Nobody argues working hard and being rewarded for hard work is a good thing. That it would be an insane thing for someone to argue. Like that's why the evils of socialism is so appealing. Is the foundational uh, the this, the first argument, the cornerstone of the argument, is that people that work hard to make things get ripped off. Alienation of labor, right, is the the phrase for Marxism. And all of a the sudden, they just spiral out of control and go, well, since you're not allowed to own your labor, the state should own everyone's labor. That, that was never the answer to it, but it's, it's kind of a problem. So that's the, uh, that's the main issue that you run into, though, is man was made to work. We're, we're made to work and protect. That's the purpose of life. Now, why? What do we do inside of that? Like, what was the ultimate? I mean, obviously, cultivating trees here isn't a big, like, eternal value, so there's more to it. But initial, first principles, work and protect. And then, be fruitful and multiply. So, work hard, protect the innocent, have a family. Those are the basics, right? We're just starting at Genesis, looking forward to what we have, what we're given, what we're supposed to do. This is an immortal being at this point. So there's some sense in which God expects a continuous working and, and multiplying. Our job on earth is to continue to diligently work. Now, that doesn't mean work yourself to death, obviously, because in the same section, right, we have a Sabbath. There's a rest. But there's a, a proper proportion of rest. There's, you know, a, uh, there's a, it's, it's usually, you know, ratios of six to one. Six days of work, one day of rest. Our modern society is built around five to two. Five days of work for, uh, you know, trading your labor for money, generally. And then two days of rest, which turn into, depending on how you do church or when, what day you use to mow the lawn, it, it still winds up being, you know, five days of work for money, one day of work around the house, and then a day of rest. Is uh, usually how it goes. So, it's just fascinating, though, because there's never an idea of retirement in the Bible, where you're just, you're old enough 
you don't have to work anymore. Like it's assumed that you would continue working until you were physically incapable of work. Because that's what we're here for. Um, that doesn't mean continuously trading your time for money, obviously. There are many ways to work. A lot of people, after they retire, you know, find a part-time job and then just spend a bunch of time with the grandkids and fix up stuff around the house. That's still, you're still working, right? You're still doing things. Um, it's when people think they can just sit in front of cable until they die. That's, that's where you start having issues, right? That's where you see people just have a cascade of health problems immediately. We're built to work. You're use it or lose it is the way God built our bodies and the world. So if you sit around all the time, your ability to get up and do things will slowly get lost. Versus, I mean, you'll see 80-year-old guys run up and down ladders a lot of times. Um, you'll see 65-year-old guys still on ladders at the job site doing stuff. You know, 50, 60 years old, easy. Not quite as fast, but they're clever enough they make up for it. And they don't have to go back and fix mistakes like the young guys do every two minutes. So, it's, uh, that's the whole point of the uh, John Bevere's Multiply book, though, is in a more general, more immediate sense, multiply. Whatever it is your hands on right now, whatever it is you're doing, work to increase it. Don't just work to maintain it. And he, uh, he uses a lot of personal stories of people that he knows to kind of weave together a fascinating narrative that kind of spans the whole book. Initially, though, or sorry, fundamentally, his point is in the parable of the talents, faithful uh, stewards multiplied what they were given. And the, uh, the wicked and lazy steward only maintained what he had. And so if you're at a place in your life where you're not really striving to succeed, you're also probably not living uh, in God's will as, as, be as best as you could be. I mean, he doesn't go as far as to say, like, it's sinful to sit around, but I, that's the gist I got from what Jesus was saying, you know? Uh, to just sit there and not do anything. Now, it doesn't mean, like, get a, not getting promotions is sinful, but... To be understanding that your goal is to do the very best at everything you do all day, every day. And that's echoed throughout the scriptures. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, 16 or 17, it might be farther on. It's towards the end of the chapter. Paul's going through stuff. And he says um, to uh, you know work hard, live lives of quiet godliness, mind your own business. Like The exact phrase shows up. It's pretty awesome. Um. He says, mind your own business and uh, tend tend to your own business. Have a mind for your work. And uh, it's I, it's either in that verse or it was the, the other one that I uh, referenced. It was uh, use your um, work for God. Essentially, the punchline was Jesus cuts your paycheck. Uh, you're working for Jesus because he's ultimately the one who gives you the reward. Is a little closer to his phrasing. He used the word reward. Um, but yeah, layman's terms, Jesus is the one cutting your paycheck. So you need to work like you're working for Jesus every day. And Jesus lays out in the parable of the talents. Grow what you've been given. Um, and that's, you know, yes, that's your job at work. That's also your, your family at home. Your goal should not be to just maintain your children, but make sure that you want them to, to flourish and grow. To learn everything they could possibly learn. To be capable of as many skills as possible when they leave your home. To, to have a good game plan for how they're going to uh, attack life and conquer and move forward and uh, learn their own way to, to work in the world. Um, and then at your job, I, I mean, don't be like power mad, but ambition isn't a bad thing unless it rules you. Then it becomes, you know, a, a wicked thing. When ambition for ambition's sake or ambition for the sake of avarice and uh, money, yeah, that that's, that's when it's evil. But the desire to do more and to produce more is uh, is a good and godly one. He calls us to to work. He calls us to, to multiply what we've been given, and that's not limited to just people in the church. And um, in the in the multiply book, he connects that idea then also to the ideas of calling and gifting. And uh, he he does a decent job of of pulling out. It's funny. I've never seen somebody writing in this genre who is just blatantly unafraid to mention Greek words, uh, and he handles them very, uh, very well. 
because he'll mention the Greek word. And then he applies why it was important to mention, and then he slides right past it uh, with plenty of information on either side. So if you get hung up and you don't really track, you can just keep reading through, and it'll make sense on the back end of why he mentioned that word. And it blends right into the rest of the narrative. Uh, it's really cool. A lot of people, they mention Greek words and then share way too much information. Or, because I, I know a fair amount of biblical Greek stuff. Like I, don't, I can't read it without tools and, and texts around me and a lexicon on hand. But I, I know a lot of the, the high frequency, the high traffic words and the verses where those high traffic words are at. And so I'll hear a pastor talk around mentioning a Greek word where the like stutter step coming up to it and then just kind of reference it and then run around it almost like they're afraid to say the Greek word because they're like I don't want to lose anybody I, I think I think the way John Bevere does is excellent because it forces you if you don't know Greek to expand your mind a little bit and go oh yeah the Bible wasn't written in English that's a funny sounding word oh there's a little nuance to it that isn't carried over in the English exactly that's fun and he keeps moving and so you learn something in that moment and I think that is awesome because not enough people are doing that in general. Uh, I think there should be a push for the average person in the pew to know just, you know, a little more than they did yesterday. I'm not saying everybody needs to get a master's of divinity, but be be trying, be doing something, you know. If you've been a Christian for more than five years and you don't know what a Strong's Concordance is or how to use one, you're doing something wrong or your pastor's doing something wrong. Uh, there's, there's a whole world out there that, you should at least be aware of and know how to navigate even if you ever vi you never visit, right? In school, they want us to know where Europe is and what the names of the countries in Europe are, even though, you know, 80, 90% of us will never go to Europe in our lifetime. Okay. I, I think theology needs to be handled that way by the average pastor of... I mean, 90% of you guys are never going to, 95 to 99% of you guys are never going to get a Master's of Divinity and teach Bible college and write books or whatever. That's fine. Know that world exists and know some of the major stops on the road in that world. Um, you know, understand what Calvinism is, Armenianism. Understand why there are different denominations and what distinguishes the biggest denominations from each other. What is their, you know, doctrinal flag that each of the denominations wave and why they say that they're a different church than the other churches and whatever. You know, just know the know Europe exists. Know the names of at least most of the big countries there, you know. I can't name the entire Western European bloc, but, you know, Italy, France, Spain, Portugal... The UK, I'm not entirely clear on how much of the UK is the UK or whatever. Um, you, know, you get the, the Netherlands and Newfoundland and Denmark. I'm like, all right, I know that's there. I could find it on a map if I was curious and, you know, get lost on a Wikipedia binge for a while. That's all I want the average Christian to be able to do with theology. And you can't do that. I mean, imagine not knowing Europe exists. You would never be able to learn anything about Italy because you wouldn't even know Europe exists, right? A lot of Christians are that way with theology, and I think it's a shame. Anyway, my my soapbox. Um, so the, the Multiply book, what he does is he ties this idea of God has called us to work. I don't think he mentions Genesis. That's, that's my thing. Uh, that's my other soapbox. Anyway... Um, but he, he lays out what's a really interesting philosophy, uh, theology of work, uh, an ergology, if you will, that he, uh, he then unites what you see in the Bible and what you see in Christian circles as calling and gifting. He unites that with the marketplace to say that, yes, a pastor and a missionary aren't specially called. They're just called to be pastors and missionaries. Uh, plumbers and electricians and software designers and athletes and billionaires, uh, bil you know, billionaire real estate moguls, they're called by God to be those things, and they're gifted by God to excel in those areas. So then what are they doing to multiply God's kingdom with their gifts now while they're, while they're working and doing, right? 
Um, some examples he gives is uh, some guy who, like a billionaire real estate guy, started making, a, he started asking the Holy Spirit, like, what do, you, what do you want me to do today, God? What are we doing? And he write ideas down on a notepad as he was prayerfully uh, considering his day. And he started, like, buying hospitals in Vietnam and, uh, you know, getting them run well and doing whatever he was doing. That's awesome. Um, I, as an electrician, do stuff for people at church when they need it, just because, you know, I'll find like a, a free Saturday or something or an evening and I'll, you know, run over to their house and, and help them out for an hour or two because that's, it's my trade. It's a gifting that I have, um, but that's not the sole limit of serving and building God's kingdom because um, you also have, as I'm at work, I'm able to share the gospel and minister to the people there. Um, the, the best way I heard it put Pastor David Conboy, you are the pastor of where you at. You are the pastor of where you're at, is uh, the way he said it. Uh, which just gives such a beautiful clarity and, uh, and vision for a Christian in the workplace. Uh, your pastor pastors you, and then you now are pastoring in your workplace. You're, you know, you're encouraging other Christians to uh, maintain their, uh, their, their life of godliness. And you are encouraging, um, you're, you're trying to draw the non-Christians towards Christ by being a godly example, by uh, helping, uh, by, by being helpful, by being available. A lot of times just making people aware that you're a Christian um, and just making sure it's, it's not hidden, making sure it's obvious for people. You'll get some of the most random questions from folks who are just curious about something where they're like, hey... Uh, and they, they'll, they'll ask you, hey, what do you think about this? Or, hey, you're married. What do you think about... And now, instantly, you're able to minister to somebody. And they would never walk into church. They would never ask a pastor. But they know that guy at work like, kind of has his life together. And he's married, too. And maybe he's had this problem before. And what do you think? And they'll just float ideas past you if you have that relationship built up. Um, if, you know, you have all your ducks in a row, so to speak. And so that's that's uh, that's uh, that's part of calling, but it's not just telling people at work about Jesus, and it's not just doing work for the church for free in your trade. Uh, those are just the easiest ways that you can see yourself build the kingdom. The point he makes in the book is being, uh, in my case, being an electrician and expanding my electrician business or expanding my sphere of influence as I work for somebody else's company is, is a, how I build the kingdom. It's, uh, it's what I'm called to do, and the gifts that I've been given are going to help me succeed and excel in the calling and expect the Holy Spirit to show up and help me. And I will tell you, I've, I've prayed for screws that uh, they, they were lost forever on the floor, and I'll find them when I'm in a pinch. Or I'll have, uh, I'll need a single part instead of having to make a 30 minute, you know, 45 minute round trip to the supply house for one clamp that I can't make something up to code to pass inspection for tomorrow. Instead of wasting an hour round trip to the supply shop, I can just, you know, like maybe there's one on the truck. Maybe I haven't seen them for months though. I don't know prayerfully digging through the bin, you know, 10 minutes later, I go, oh, look, exactly one little screw, exactly one little clamp. Um, that's, that's God at work. That's the Holy Spirit helping me, you know, succeed in my craft, in my trade. And uh, so the, the point of John Bevere's book is to just that all the time with every, wherever you're at. Um, and, and be aware of your giftings because it's not singular, right? It's not just one thing. I have a gift of teaching and I'm still trying to figure out where exactly God wants me to use that or do that. I've been available to teach at my church. None of those things have really panned out or they've all seemed to fall through. No problem. Uh, no stress. I'm just making myself available and uh, continuing to try and study and learn and just because I'm interested by this stuff. And that's, that's why I'm on Facebook, the YouTubes, sharing what knowledge I do have, because uh, it's got to go somewhere, man. I'm just talking to the car to myself if the phone's not on. So the, uh, 
that's the thing is everybody can have all kinds of different gifts and you just got to figure out where your gifting applies or what God wants you to do with your particular uh, package, you know? Uh, there was a, there's a story in the book about a guy who's a mechanic, runs a, runs a car fixing shop. And uh, oddly enough, also has a gift of teaching. And he teaches at his local church. And he really wanted to pursue this gift of teaching. And so he strikes out, um, kind of gets out, tries to back away from the car fix it shop for a while. And he starts teaching full time at a larger church than he previously attended. And wouldn't you know it, everything fell through. It didn't work out. It wasn't a good fit. And he found... He went right back to his calling, his actual calling, was to be a car mechanic who also taught at his local church. And he started really doubling down on his uh, auto business and started opening up more shops. And the Lord blessed him in that area. And a lot of times that's how you find your blessing and your calling, so your gifting and your calling, is you just try stuff. And you, you pray and you prayerfully pursue opportunities Or try to make opportunities, and when things fall through, you go, well, I guess God didn't want that. All right. And then God will bless certain opportunities, and you go, well, all right, I guess this is the right road. We'll go down this hallway for a while till the door closes and a window opens, you know. And that's that's how you find uh, your calling. That's how you find your gifts a lot of times. Just try things and, you know, be trying, be prayerful. Uh, Walk with the Lord, and uh, you'll awesome things happen. So that's all I got today, though. Uh, it's an awesome book. It comes out tomorrow. This is the last day if you pre-order on, uh, what is it, messengerinternational.org, and you'll find it. They put it at the top of their page there. And uh, the X Multiply book, they, you get a free audio book if you order today. It's pre-order today. And then it's actually officially released tomorrow on the 17th, which is pretty cool. And uh, that's uh, the reason I bought the book and really dove in is because uh, you don't hear this message anywhere else. Uh, I I haven't heard this kind of message anywhere else. And so I decided to um, support a guy who had that message, which uh, I think has been working out pretty well, doing stuff. Um, Yeah, that's all I got. Uh, Also, I don't know where you listen to this at, but I'm in all the places doing all the things. For I don't I basically do nothing on Instagram but comment on other people's posts. I still don't understand Instagram. I'm convinced it's for women, um, but there's some some decent gun places that that make a, a go at it, and Babylon B seems to just repost all their Twitter stuff there. Uh, I just don't have time. I don't have time for that. But uh, these videos would be all the places uh, I live stream them to Facebook and then throw them up on YouTube, and then uh, put stuff on my own site, which is follow the leader dot one and uh then also other words that i'm saying oh i stripped the audio from the videos and put it in podcast which by the way i apologize for just becoming a ghost on podcast things for just months but that was what i needed to do uh the book that i've just finished writing and uh, it feels sleazy to like mention my book when i spent time talking about john bevere's after i you know like on his launch team so i'm not this, I've mentioned it other places. I'll, I'll do a thing on it later after after tomorrow. After after tomorrow. Anyway, um, so that's right. I apologize if you're listening on Audio Mac. Uh, you're awesome, and I apologize for like never looking at Audio Mac. I I apologize deeply. I have like nine thousand listens over there that accrued in the last like six months, which blows my mind. Um, so yeah, I'm posting consistently there now again, and uh, should, as the Lord wills, get back in the, the habit of things. I want to get back on my Blue Collar Bible Scholar series, where I'm going through books of the Bible, and just giving like a, a brief primer on, here's the basic background information on this book of the Bible, and uh, what would essentially be the first uh, first couple pages of any commentary on a book of the Bible, but in a more accessible audio format. Um, just to give you a basic idea, then when you sit down and read the book, you already kind of have a, a mental blueprint of what's happening, uh, what some of the history is behind it, and what some of the oddball passages you might run across as you go through it. Uh, but I'm not I'm not in a place where I can 
clear my mental space to really start cranking out those every day. Because I got to basically, I podcast the whole day listening to Bible commentaries and different uh, authors and listening to the text of the book over and over again as I work that day and then record it on the drive home while the stuff's fresh in my head with a little 3 by 5 card of talking points. Uh, it's a little elaborate. I haven't, um, I haven't got back in that flow yet. I'm not quite ready for it. I got to figure out how to market a book that I just wrote because I only barely know how to write a book and I definitely don't know how to do online marketing. This is, it's been an adventure. Uh, but I think that's all I've got. Uh, anybody listening to this is incredibly awesome. And, uh, thank you for your time. And if you're listening on the podcast, once again, I apologize for just disappearing for like six or eight months. Um, but, uh, Lord willing, we're back now. Back and better than ever. Uh, hopefully I can find some kind of consistent regularity. And uh, at least, my goal is at least three a week of something. Like do like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday or something. But yeah, consistency is key. And I I ain't found it yet. But I'm working on it. Uh, you know, baby steps, man. Baby steps. All right. That's all I've got. Don't take my word for it. And uh, Godspeed. Bye.